How do front wings affect a car's aerodynamics? Putting wings on the back of a car is very common, and while they aren't as efficient as producing downforce as underbodies are, they still work very well. But you almost never see wings on the front of cars. There are a few sketches of some ideas in figures 1 to 4 here, scrolling up. And perhaps the most famous example was the short-lived idea of putting one on the front of the Lamborghini Countach. And I can see why it was short-lived, because it was ugly. I mean, sure, it might have improved the car's handling, but if I had the choice of either driving safely in an ugly car or crashing and burning in a good-looking car, well, I think we all know which one I would choose. But the aerodynamic benefits of a front wing can't be denied. For example, in podcast 198 from a couple of weeks ago, we covered how producing more downforce over the front wheels can help reduce understeer, as well as help balance the car in general. So to see how a front wing affects a car's aerodynamics, we're looking at this paper here called CFD Analysis of the Influence of the Front Wing Setup on a Time Attack Sports Car's Aerodynamics. It is open access, so you can find it in the link below. And this is actually our 200th podcast, which I think is the tops. So this paper focuses on the benefits of a front wing, potentially for a time attack race. And apparently, according to the racers, 60% of the results in a time attack race is influenced by the aerodynamics of a car. So with aerodynamics playing such a huge role, it's easy to see why looking into something even as weird as a front wing is enticing. So to look at this idea, these researchers used the Ariana Husario which was a sports car, as we can see in figure five down here. And the awesome thing is that they also tested a, few, a bunch of different front wing designs, as we can see in figure six. So we have three here, but they also tested a bunch of different locations. So the three airfoils that they tested was first just a regular airfoil shape. And I tried finding the name of this wing profile in the method, but I can't seem to find it. So. Just a general description is that it is very thick and quite cambered, so it is very much like a regular car wing profile. In addition to this plane wing, they also tested one with what they say is a gurney flap turned off, so it is almost parallel to the trailing edge, and it was kind of acting like a slot. Then they also tested the wing with a gurney flap on, so it shoots straight up as a regular gurney flap, as you can see here in figure 6C. So I'm really interested to see this one's aerodynamics because gunny flaps do greatly increase the downforce production of a wing, but it comes at the expense of a significant increase in drag. And when you look at its aerodynamics, it definitely isn't to that streamline. So that's interesting because it is a front wing and as such, anything that happens over the front of it will affect the rest of the car. Usually you want as much clean flow as possible hitting the rest of the car so that the other aerodynamic devices such as the rear wing at the back or even the roof and if you have the underbody you want all these things to operate as efficiently as possible and you need to have clean flow usually for that to happen so having this gurney flap potentially spoiling the flow is a real possibility and potential cons consequences of this are a reduction in the efficiency of the car now let's jump quickly to figure 17 because as i mentioned they not, not just tested these three different wings, they tested a bunch of different locations. <laughs> like you can see all these different locations here. And that is awesome in that we can see how these locations affected the car's aerodynamics. But it also gives us good insight into their CFD setup and why they went the way they did. So jumping back to figure seven, here we go. Here's figure seven. We see their CFD domain, and these researchers only did CFD to investigate this. The domain is good. It is effectively about the same size of an automotive wind tunnel. One thing that isn't great is that they CFD'd only half the car and then mirrored their results. As we covered in podcast 198, where this approach was also taken, it's not great because it cuts out all the unsteadiness of the car's aerodynamics. However, they used RANS here, which is steady state inherently, so the unsteadiness of the wake does get cut out anyway from that. Even still, I would be interested to see if the entire car would change any results. Now in figure eight, we see something quite strange and that is the front wing in its own domain. You can see this uh, cylinder here and then the wing inside. Why is that? Are they testing this wing separately? Well, actually no. And this is where all these configurations we saw in figure 17 come into play. So these researchers say that because there are so many configurations they are testing, the meshing time is quite a lot. So to cut down that meshing time, they actually went with an overset mesh approach. Now, this may seem a little weird, so let me explain what is happening. So they're using something called an overset mesh, and that is where you literally have two meshes in the same domain. 
you have the global mesh, which is what we see in figure seven here. And then we have the mesh in figure eight, which is literally just for the wing. You then place the wings mesh somewhere in the global domain. And then these two meshes can now share information between each other. And in this particular case, for each front wing location, they are moving this wings mesh around to that point. The reason why they're doing that is because apparently doing it this way is quicker than remeshing the entire domain for every wing. So that is an interesting finding because overset meshes take quite a lot of time to solve because you now have all these additional cells. However, one main reason why this overset mesh isn't as time consuming here as most overset meshes would be is that this one isn't moving during the simulation. Usually overset meshes are used for motion. So for example, if you were to change the wings angle of attack with time, then an overset mesh would be a prime candidate. There are also other ways to do it, but overset meshes are the perfect way and very powerful. Here, this simulation is not is steady state, so there is no movement during this simulation. That then cuts down the overset mesh solving time, and I think that this is why it is quicker to see this overset mesh being used than to remesh every wing location. If there was some kind of movement, I wonder if that would still hold in terms of the overset mesh is quicker. I'm not sure. So anyway, it is good thinking here by these researchers because it is an out of the box approach, simply because overset meshes are almost always used for motion. And to think about it, using it for a steady state simulation is really clever. One additional note is that the overset mesh, so this wings mesh, is that they chose to use the same size cells inside of this like little wing mesh compared to the global domain. This isn't a big deal, but it can definitely change the accuracy of the simulation and even make it unstable. So for example, if the cells inside the overset mesh are eight times the size of the ones outside, then that means that a lot of information inside this one and outside is lost during the passing phase between the two zones. That can lead to massive instabilities. So while you definitely don't want to have um, two different size cells, having the exact same size cells are not strictly true, but it is recommended. You don't need to have it, but it is a good idea. So, so far, I'm really liking the CFD setup. Let's move on. So they had five layers for their boundary layer and with a 1.2 growth rate, which seems fine. They say that they chose the Y plus value to be in the log layer range, which doesn't tell us exactly how low it was, but because they used the realizable KFS long terminus model, this general Y plus is okay. The benefit of the KFS long terminus model is you can get away with a much higher Y plus value and hence fewer cells. However, I would have preferred the KMIG SST terminus model because it is just better, and that is a scientific fact. So the terminus density was 5%, which is good because that makes things more approximate to the real world. Now in figure nine, we see that the, first of all, the velocity was 40 meters per second. And we see that in figure nine, we see another really cool thing that these researchers did. So they tested different refinement zone sizes on the car's forces. This is rarely done in a paper like this because this paper is more to do with the front wings aerodynamics and not so much with CFD development. But to see it here is really cool. And you can see that the refinement zone here gets bigger and bigger. It not only gets longer, but it's also getting taller. And what you can't see here is it's also getting wider. So they call this their a BOI, which stands for body shaped body, sorry, box shaped body of influence. So in other words, this refinement zone. In table 10, we see how the different BOIs affect the drag and lift coefficients. So table one here. What's more, we also see how different finenesses of the mesh affect these values too. So that's cool in how they've been going about this CFD so far. So for the, the drag coefficient, we see that there isn't really a general trend in figure 10 here. That's because for the coarsest mesh, increasing the BOI size changed the drag coefficient by a lot, but then the same can't be said of the medium mesh. So you can see here, this these um, X's, it changes a lot, but then for the circles, it doesn't change too much. And then for the triangles, it changes quite a bit again. So you can't really say that changing the BOI size changes the drag coefficient, or it makes it more steady. What, now, one thing to note is that all these changes are within a couple percent. So that is well within the CFD error here, given that it is RANS, but it is still interesting to see how they change. For the lift coefficient, which is in figure 10b, the only real conclusion we can arrive at is that changing the BOI size changes the results for all of the mesh finenesses. So I think this study of the BOI is interesting, 
but not really worth too much here other than general interest. And that is because the errors in the CFD are still too much to be able to use this information. Now in table two, sorry, uh, here we go, table two down here, we see the mesh independence test. And again, the researchers did a really good job here, but they just present the information in a really weird way. So here, they don't say how many cells in each mesh are used, but they just tell us that the characteristic size is a certain amount. So 0.04, for example. There's nothing wrong with that, but it just makes it very unconventional and it makes it harder to understand what is going on. So I just did a few calculations and assuming that the change in the characteristic size translates directly to the number of cells, the medium mesh should be about 2.1 times greater than the uh, coarse mesh. And then the fine mesh should be about 2.1 times the size of the medium mesh in terms of cells. So that is really great. These researchers have done a great job with increasing the number of cells between levels of finenesses and by a long way. So for the drag coefficient, there is almost no difference between the medium and fine meshes, this one here. Um, so the medium mesh is fine, we can conclude. For the lift coefficient, there is a 2.5% difference between the medium and fine meshes. And given that this is a RAN simulation, 2.5% is fine. Like that's probably within the error. So the researchers went with the medium mesh, which is a good choice. And that is unfortunately where the CFD method description ends. There is no validation, which is a fairly big weakness. And given that there isn't any validation, I think from here on in, we should trust the general trends of any force changes more than about 10, 15 or 20%. Um, anything less than that is probably within the CFD error. As a side note, if you want to learn how to do CFD and OpenFoam, which is a completely free and really good CFD software, but really hard to learn, then check out our courses in the link below. Let's move on to the results now though. So in table three and figure 12, we see a little bit of information. In table three, we see the effects of the front wing on the car's aerodynamics, which is located in figure 12. Without the front wing, the lift coefficient is still negative, so that's pretty good. It's minus 0 0.302, so that's downforce. That's great. But with the wing, regardless of the configuration, whether that is the regular wing or whether that is the wing with the gurney flap, the overall lift coefficient drops. So there's even more downforce produced whenever you put this front wing in front of the car. So that's great. That's what it's supposed to do, at least in theory. And the reason why I say that, at least in theory, is because these researchers also give a breakdown of the front and rear lift coefficients in this table. What we see is that the front wing, for the front wing, the lift, the lift coefficient for the front is always lower than without the front wing. So that's good. But for the rear lift coefficient, when you add a front wing, it always drops. So it went from minus 0 0.154 to minus 0 0.089. So that's a massive reduction in the downforce. Why would that be? Well, currently we don't have any more information to tell us exactly why this is occurring, but a likely reason is that this front wing is now changing the flow over the car and most likely over the top of the car. And that will then mess with how much downforce you are able to produce there. There is also the possibility that the rear wing is seeing worse flow, so it isn't working as well, and that would then eat into the rear lift production. Either way, we can see that the front wing messes with the flow enough to negatively affect the rear lift. That doesn't necessarily need to be the case, but we'll see how different wing positions affect the rear lift later on. On a good note, the drag coefficient is unaffected by this front wing positioned right here. The changes are very small and within the simulation's error, so that's really good. Now in figure 13, we see a really cool breakdown of the drag of each section of the car. While the total drag coefficient doesn't change much between these wing configurations, especially not given the error of the CFD, the regions where the drag is produced does. So adding a front wing obviously results in drag being produced on the front wing because now there is one there. But interestingly, the drag over the car itself drops in this leftmost column here. And in the most extreme cases, which is with the gunny flap on, so when it is deployed, the front wing now has a drag coefficient of about 0.075, which is really high. Interestingly, the rear wing, front wheels and rear wheels have the same drag coefficient regardless of whether the front wing is there or not, which kind of is interesting considering that we saw a drop in the rear lift coefficient. So we know something is happening there, but the drag is not being affected of these particular components. Then in figure 14, we see the same breakdown, but now for the lift coefficient. The wheels aren't affected, but the rear wing is producing a little less downforce. So that means that the rear wing is producing less downforce, but perhaps a little less drag, but it's probably within the error of the CFD. However, 
the rest of the car. So the underbody and the top of the roof is where so much of the downforce is lost. Because it is severely affected the rear lift coefficient, it is safe to say that the, lift, the downforce lost over the car was more towards the rear of the car too. So that's where it's occurring. And in figure 16, we now see the pressure coefficient over the cars with and without the front wing and the difference between them in figure 16b. So we have it with the front wing, without it, and now the difference in the right section here. So we can see that with the front wing, there is much lower pressure over the very front of the nose. You can see how blue it is there. And there's also a little bit of high pressure over the A pillar compared to without the front wing. So that is interesting in that the front wing is really affecting the flow over the A pillar. I wonder how that affects the vortex production there. Anyway, for the rest of the car, it is difficult to tell much of a difference in the pressures. Perhaps over the rear window, there is a, there are small regions. If I zoom in, here we go. Uh, perhaps there are small regions here and there of slightly higher pressure, but it is minimal, I think. So from this figure, it is a little hard to tell just why the front wing is increasing the rear lift coefficient. And perhaps over the C pillar is why that is occurring. I'm not too sure. Another interesting area is the wingtip region of the rear wing. So these two regions here, if we look at just there. With the front wing, the pressure is much lower over the top surface, which means that the rear wing isn't producing as much downforce there, which we kind of saw before. That makes a lot of sense and seems to be because the A pillar and C pillar flows are altered by the front wing and then that impacts the rear wing. So now in figure seven, let's move back up to figure seven. Oh, sorry, figure 17. We go down here. We see again the different placements of the front wing. And in figure 18, we see the effects they have on the lift coefficient with different wing angles of attack. So you can see if we zoom into each one, we have the uh, downforce and then for zero degrees, five degrees, 15 degrees and 10 degrees. And it's really cool because the authors have done such a good job being able to convey this information to us. They've color coded these results. So red is worse, green is better in terms of downforce. It is clear that the top row is always doing really well. So these configurations up here are doing much better than down near the nose, which is performing much worse. They're the red, red is bad. What that means is that for this particular setup, putting the front wing higher than the roof and over the nose produces most, the most downforce and it is by a long way. So we can see here that, um, for example, the worst position was almost at ground level and in the front of the nose, so the front right at 15 degrees, the lift coefficient was minus 0 0.292, which is still pretty good. It's still negative. So there's downforce, but when you put the wing in the best position, so about roof height a little bit higher and about over the nose slash the front of the windshield, the lift coefficient drops to like minus 0 0.36, uh, 0 0.637, 0 0.645, 0 0.642. They're really low. That's like double the downforce. They don't give any flow vis yet to see why this position is so much better. But if I were to guess, it would probably be because this swing is in very clean flow and its wake doesn't impact the rest of the car. So that means that the rest of the car can, uh, can perform a little bit better. And because it is producing downforce, the wake will be shooting up over the car more. So the rest of the car can still work here. Alternatively, when the wing is right in front of the car, so this red region here, its wake will directly impact the car. And while it's, it's seeing clean flow, this wing, there is still some kind of upstream effects of the car that is creating this blockage effect. So that will cause the front wing to underperform and even stall at low angles of attack because of the back pressure on it. So in figure 19, we see the effects of the different locations on the downforce coefficient with different angles of attack. So we have from zero in the top left, five in the top right, 10 in the top bottom left, and 15 degrees in the bottom right. And zooming out, we can see pretty much the same trends in all of them. So effectively, as the wing goes higher up, more downforce is produced. Then as a secondary trend, the, the further back the the front wing is over the car, so over the front windshield, for example, the more downforce is produced too. Now, in terms of the drag coefficient, figure 20 shows us similar trends, where the higher the wing goes, the greater the drag coefficient becomes, and the further back the wing goes, the greater the drag coefficient becomes too, generally speaking. So the increased downforce pretty much always comes with an added drag penalty. And in figure 21, 
we see the effects of the wing position on the front downforce coefficient. And we can conclude again that pretty much that the increase in the overall downforce comes from the front downforce. Now in figure 22, we see that as expected, increasing the front wing's angle of attack from zero degrees to five degrees comes with increased downforce. So the triangles to the circles pretty much with all these Y locations, the height locations. So if that angle increased past the stall angle, then obviously we would expect a drop in the downforce, but here it's below that stall angle, so that's pretty good. And likewise, in figure 23, we see that as the angle of attack increases, so this is for the drag coefficient, the drag coefficient also increases. So that makes sense. It comes with a drag penalty, which is what we saw with other values too. Now, in figure 24, we see the downforce to drag ratio, which is really kind of everything in terms of efficiency. And as the height of the front wing increases, the ratio gets higher and higher at the best positions shown here. The car is producing like a downforce to drag ratio 90% better than the regular car, which is this red line here, the reference value. That's almost double the downforce to drag ratio. That's how efficient it's becoming. So that's really impressive considering that the front wing isn't that big, but it produces so much more downforce for such a low drag penalty. That's really, really good. Now jumping to figure 30, we see some really cool flow vis. There are a few other figures, but they just show pretty much the same general information we've seen before. Figure 30 is where we see some good information now in terms of flow vis. Let's zoom out a little bit here. There we go. That's good. Okay, so we can see how these different wing locations affects the flow. So the wing can be seen in the gray area around the front. So let me zoom in this gray bit here, that's the wing. This is the wing here too. And then the wing is right at the front here. Now let's zoom, here we go. So how do these different wing locations affect the flow over the car? Now for the top right figure is when the wing is just ahead of the nose of the car. And we can see that the flow from it wraps around the sides and then it kicks up a little bit as well. So up around the top of the rear wheels. Remember that with this configuration, the downforce coefficient is the worst out of any wing uh, position and it makes a lot of sense because you can see just how much the flow from the wing messes with the rest of the car so the rest of the car will now produce less downforce probably because they're struggling to get clean flow so surfaces that have been developed to work with clean flow are now not seeing that clean flow contrasting that with the bottom two figures so these two here where the wing is higher we see that the wing's wake jumps over the car so the car isn't as affected that correlates well with the fact that the car produces a lot more downforce here. But there are two important things to note here. The first is that for the front, sorry, the bottom left figure, this one here, the wings wake kind of pushes the flow over the car uh, down a little bit. So you can see in the wake here, the flow is kind of being pushed down perhaps a little bit more. Um, it stops the car being able to control the flow a bit more normally. And that can definitely impact the downforce that the car is producing, potentially reducing it. The second important point to note is that putting the wing high, you might say, okay, well now it's going to be out of the car's wake and you're not going to affect it too much. But <laughs> the flow over the rear window is now separating. <laughs> so that makes sense kind of because the wing's wake is up a little bit, it's at an angle. And with that, the flow over the car now has more of an upwards angle too. And that is now making the flow more prone to stalling. So on the one hand, when the front wing is lower down, it squishes the flow over the car's roof and helps it stay attached. On the other hand, when the wing is higher up, the flow is now separating potentially much worse. So remarkably, looking at the flow around the sides of the car for these two wing positions, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference. Like they're not affected really at all compared to perhaps the baseline case, maybe a little bit, but not too much. So the front wing's effects are very much localized to the roof of the car and potentially uh, it's bad in, in certain cases. So moving to figure 31, for the top four figures here, this is figure 31, there are eight figures. And for the top four, we see the front wing produces huge vortices. You can see they wrap around a lot. From the bottom left figure, they are then traveling over the A pillar and the C pillar, which is likely the cause of the changes in the pressure coefficients we saw in these regions earlier in figure 16, if you remember back that pressure coefficient plot. Then for the bottom four figures, we can see that the rear wake is always altered with the presence of the wing. That makes a lot of sense because the front wing is altering how the flow goes around the car. Where it is going, 
and which regions will separate more readily and which regions will get higher flow rates. So it's really affecting the, the car a lot. In figure 32, we see the pressure coefficient and immediately for the bottom right figure, this one here, we see so much low pressure over the roof of the car between the rear wing and the, the um, front wing, sorry, and the roof of the car. That low pressure will also come with a very high velocity as it accelerates through and that makes the separation over the rear window a little even more surprising because even though the flow is angled up more by the wing, it must be moving much faster and it still couldn't stay attached. So just as a side note, when the flow is faster, it has a much better chance of staying attached because it takes longer for it to decelerate to the point of stalling. So here it's quite interesting that we have two conflicting events and unfortunately the negative event is winning out. Now in figure 33, we see the pressure coefficient over the car and this is figure 33 here. And for the top right figure, the pressure is a lot higher in the inlet, so the cooling flow at the front, and that leads to much higher drag. So it's interesting how this wing ahead of the car here is creating this effect, and it's probably because the wing is hindering the flow from moving out of the way of the car until it is very close. So what usually happens when there's no front wing is that as the air gets closer to the car, the more it moves out of the way. But here, the wing is stopping that from happening until it gets really close to the car, and by then, it is really late, and it stagnates much more, hence why we get such a high pressure here and more drag. Now in figure 34, we see the Q criterion isosurfaces, and this shows us where the vortices are on the car. And immediately it is clear that for the two bottom figures, there are huge wingtip vortices. And that is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is that there are such large ones, even though there are end plates on this wing. So perhaps the end plates need to be revised. The second reason is that for the top right figure, we see that the wing still produces some wingtip vortices, but not nearly as large ones. So we can see there are like these little green blue ones as opposed to these massive orange red ones. So having the car directly behind the front wing hinders its ability to produce downforce. And with that, we come to the end of this podcast. It was really cool to see how front wing affected this supercar's aerodynamics because even though it was very ugly, it might have had some secret aero benefits, and it did. We saw that positioning it higher up, the downforce skyrocketed and was well worth the drag penalty as long as you maintain the downforce balance over the car, of course. So finally, this was done with CFD, and if you want to learn how to do CFD and even Omafoam, which is a really good and free software for CFD, but really hard to learn, then take our courses in the link below. And if you're doing experiments, did you know that you probably have 2 to 4% error in your results and you don't even know about it? That is because the atmospheric conditions constantly change and that affects the density of air. And 100 years ago, this wasn't such a big issue because the errors in the experimental data were very large. But today, a 4% error in your experimental data is unacceptable. It pretty much renders it worthless almost in most cases. So to fix that, check out the MC Hall below. And if you like this podcast, hit the like and subscribe buttons. And we'll see you soon. Peace, amigos.